this room. Uh, I would love to welcome the next speaker, Antonis Christofidis. Hello. Hello. And uh, we can hear you perfectly. Where are you mm -hmm. dialing in from? Where I am from? From yeah, uh, Island. Sorry? Sorry? I'm where from are you an dialing island. In from? Dialing from Greece. Yes. Discover. Yes. Okay, so um, you're self employed, uh, I read That's in right. the description, and you are provide a newsletter. So everybody who likes your talk should go to the schedule and look up uh, your homepage and subscribe. <laughs> Am I right? Okay, thanks a lot. I had. I didn't remember that actually. <laughs> okay, so I think you you're uh, already uh, prepared to do your talk. So um, l let's share your screen, and uh, I can see the headlines. So the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. So uh, I'm Antonis, and um, uh, I help water engineers bring the models to the web. And uh, essentially, my newsletter is about um, um, is for water engineers, essentially, although some other people might benefit from it. Anyway, um, those of you who have read the, the summary of my talk will know that uh, it's actually not about meta classes. I will, uh, I will get to meta classes in the end, but uh, it's going to be in the end. So don't watch the entire talk and think, uh, is this guy going to end his introduction at some point? So let's just go. Um, uh, so I have never been in court. But if I ever went in one and they asked me on which book I'd like to swear, I think I would choose this one, you know, the C programming language. It's an emotional choice. I don't program in C anymore. And whenever I do, I don't consult the book. But this is a 30-year-old item. It's the only book I keep, although I don't read it. But my focus here is the other book. All right. Uh, so if you keep one thing from this talk, it's that you should get that one and read it. I told you I help water engineers bring the models to the web and an example is this application. So very roughly we measure rainfall and uh, evaporation. And since we know how much water went in the soil and how much went out, we can tell you if you are a farmer, if and how much to irrigate in order to replenish the water that was in the soil. And I told you I'm passionate about clean code and I'm also passionate about its cousin, good documentation. And this is the documentation for the model we use. Now, this model had a parameter that we used to call the irrigation optimizer. And I had a fight about that with my colleague Nikos who is the irrigation expert. And I flat, I flat out refuse to call it the irrigation optimizer because it doesn't optimize anything. I'm sorry, I told him, this doesn't make any sense. I'm going to call it uh, the Malamos irrigation factor until you think of something better. Malamos is his name. And of course, he continued to call it the irrigation optimizer. So for a long time, we used two names. But anyway, just a couple of months ago, he thought of a new name, the refill factor. And that one is quite good because you can think of soil as a liquid container. When it empties, we need to irrigate. And the refill factor tells us how much to refill. If it's one, we fill up. If it's 0 0.7, we fill 70% of it. So you see, it's not rocket science. But if I tried to explain to you what a parameter is and called it irrigation optimizer, you would be confused. And that's why clean code starts with good names. For the main part of my talk, I'm going to take you on a tour of bad names. I hope we are going to have some fun. And at the end, we are going to get to meta classes. Uh, there are a few that came up uh, while I was watching uh, some talks in the conference and I remembered them uh, they're not in my slides but I wanted to tell you about them 
One is a black hole. Now, I'm no astronomer, but uh, I had difficulty understanding this concept at first until I understood that it's just a maybe a super dense object. Maybe you could call it a light sucker. I don't know, but it's not a hole. And anytime you have trouble understanding a concept, it's it's very often because it's named badly. For example, a virtual environment. There's nothing virtual about it. It's an isolated environment. I, I think this is why many beginners have trouble understanding virtual environments. And there's also virtual host. Uh, this is used in uh, Apache. And the same thing in Nginx is called a server, but it's not a virtual host and it's not a server. It's uh, just a domain. Anyway, to continue with my slides, let's uh, start with serverless and the fun with this is that it means the opposite of what it says if something really does not have a server you are not going to call it serverless people will talk about a standalone desktop application for instance they'll never say a, a serverless application if you hear the word serverless you can bet there's a server somewhere and my favorite instance of serverless is this post from uh, the Django users mailing list. And, you know, I, I wonder whether the typo was intentional. I don't know what a devless server is, but a serverless server, it doesn't make any more sense. Here's another one. Software requirements or functional requirements. There are functional, non-functional requirements. Many software projects begin with determining the requirements and they often end up being a deliverable report. And they should really be called feature suggestions or maybe uh, non-binding functional analysis or something. Anyway, I'll need to explain what, what YAGNI means for those who don't know it. The modern way of development is that you have a meeting with the customer once or, or twice a month uh, with the purpose of deciding what functionality you are going to develop until the next meeting. Now, in the beginning of the project, it might seem like a good idea, for example, to specify that uh, the results of search queries shall be made downloadable in CSV format. But during the regular meetings with the clients, this might never turn up or there might always be something with higher priority. So you should not develop the feature until the customer presents a problem that they need to solve now and for which you think that a good solution would be search query results in CSV in this example. This programming principle is, is called YAGNI. Always develop something when you need it and not when you foresee that you will need it. If we develop this way, why determine the feature suggestions at all at the beginning of the project, the requirements as they're called? And the answer is that you need to have the idea of where the project is going because each feature suggestion, its requirement if you prefer, on its own is YAGNI but all feature suggestions together tell a story that helps architect the project as needed. Otherwise, a year later, the customer will request a feature that you can't implement without replacing PostgreSQL with MongoDB and practically rewriting the whole thing from scratch. So I think that talking a lot with the customer at the beginning of the project and determining feature suggestions in detail is a good idea. Just don't call them requirements, because if you do call them requirements, then at the end of the project, some committee or some customer department is inevitably going to ask the question, why has requirement X not been implemented since it is, well, a requirement? Good luck explaining. That's about requirements and Let's continue with an old time classic, JavaScript. This is such a bad name that I don't know where to begin. So my sister comes and tells me, hey, Antonis, 
what computer languages do you speak? And I tell her Python and a little JavaScript. Really? I must connect you to a friend who's desperately looking for someone like you. So she sends, she sends me his web page and I see that they desperately want a Java programmer. Good luck explaining to my sister that Java and JavaScript have as much as common in common as an elephant with a cat. I mean, all right, they're both mammals, but if I tell you I have a cat, I won't really expect the discussion to go on like this. And speaking of JavaScript, I have another one, a single page application. So the last time I saw a single page application, it actually had thousands of pages. A few years ago, when uh, when a colleague tried to explain to me what a single application is, I had trouble understanding. So you might want to call it a browser-rendered application instead, or a client-rendered application. And that would have been better, but it's still a bit confusing because in the end, all applications are rendered on the client. The difference in a CRA is that the HTML is created on the client. And even this definition falls apart when you add server-side rendering to the picture. So if you can't find a better name, what you can do is call, call it Alice or Bob, Charlie, David, whatever. When it's hard to find a term that is descriptive enough, it's better to choose something irrelevant, like Python, for example, than to choose a confusing description. And besides, that's why I had used Malamos irrigation factor before we found the better refill factor. In fact, I've done this with a class of statistical models and I've, give, I've given them the name George because I can't think of a better name. George has this form. Don't try to understand the math right now. The important thing is that it has inputs, outputs and parameters. And you typically determine the parameters by calibrating George using known inputs and known outputs. Nowadays, many people use the word training instead of calibration. And they also use machine learning for the process of creating and calibrating models like George. And in fact, I am the only person I know who calls George, George. Everyone else calls it neural networks. And as you can understand, I think it's a bad choice because it suffers from two problems. It's not neural, and it's not a network. It's pretty much like this musical instrument, which is called the English horn, when actually it's a French oboe. Anyway, the discussion about neural networks brings me to artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Some people think it is the attempt to create a machine that thinks like a human. And this definition does have problems. What does it mean to think like a human? But I can accept it for a moment. The thing is, you don't need to be particularly intelligent to walk on two legs, do you? Humans do it from the age of one. Hens and ostriches also do it quite successfully. If AI is about thinking like a human, why does it also study walking on two legs? And there are other people who think that AI is about using models that incorporate probability. And I think that's a good definition. The other, way, the other time I went to my wife and said, I found an old picture of yours from, this, from the trip to Spetses. Spetses is a Greek island. And she tells me, not only did I not come on that trip, I've actually never been in Spetses. I said, okay, I found many photos, maybe I'm confusing places. So I get the photo and I check it, and there was a group of people in Spetses. And this girl isn't me, she said. She looks very much like me, but she isn't me. And so I recognized my wife on a picture, but it wasn't my wife. 
I can recognize her face with a probability of well over 99%, but it's still less than 100%. It's not like adding two and two. So image recognition, walking on two legs, natural language processing, and many other problems have an amount of uncertainty in the results. But in this case, we should not use the misleading AI. We should be using probability modeling. The other time I found an article about Pac-Man and the guy went on to explain how the ghost's AI works. But there is nothing uncertain about how these ghosts move. They confuse you when you're playing because the algorithms of their movement are ingenious, but they are very simple. So for example, here the orange ghost is going up and it has to make a decision. Either it will go up or it will turn right. So what it is going to do is it will follow the route that takes it closest to its target. Its target, if it's away from you, as in this case, its target is you. So it's going to turn right in this case. But if it's nearer to you than eight tiles, then its target is the lower left corner of the screen. So there are some more details and each ghost has a slightly different uh, target or algorithm, but essentially it's as, as real, it, it's as simple as that. So how does this, how does this person define AI? Is it an algorithm? Is it any algorithm uh, that can surprise you or any algorithm used for an autonomous character in a game? The problem is that if you use such a vague term as artificial intelligence, anyone can think you're meaning anything. And let's come to the European Union's proposed definition of AI. Last April, the European Commission published a proposal for an artificial intelligence act. And, and uh, it has provisions such as prohibiting an AI system that deploys subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness in order to materially distort a person's behavior in a manner that causes or is likely to cause that person or another person physical or psychological harm. In the directive, the definition of an AI system is essentially any system developed with any one of these techniques. And what interests me most here is the third technique. I generally agree with the European Commission. I think that AI is models that incorporate probability. Now, countless hours have been spent in order to prepare this European proposal, and hundreds of members of Parliament, thousands of assistants are going to review it, discuss it, review it again, and then the Council is going to review it, and then the Commission again, maybe the Parliament again. And anyway, tens of millions of euros will be spent. And if it passes and becomes low, is it going to be useful? If you cause a person physical or psychological harm, isn't that illegal already? Why does it matter if you used statistics to do so? None of this would have happened if we used probability modeling instead of AI. This is how damaging misleading terminology can be. So let's now come to meta classes. The official documentation says that a meta class is the class of a class. What? Uh, what does this mean? I mean, Crookshanks is a cat and the class of Crookshanks is cat. Cat is a class. So the class of a class is class, maybe? Does this make sense? Or could it be that, you know, I like to think that cat is 42, because some people think that 42 is the answer to everything. And let's try it on the Python interpreter. If you try this on the Python interpreter, you're going to get an error int object is not callable and that's interesting so if we do if we do try a callable then it works but can we try to create an object with it and we get an error again 
So I could continue exploring it and make it work somehow, but I promise it's not going to make any sense at all as long as you think of it in terms of classes of classes. And given what I've been presenting until now, I think you guess where this is going. There's no such thing as a meta class. The concept actually has as much to do with classes of classes as English horns have to do with England and horns. The correct term, I think, would be class creators. And in order to make this absolutely clear, I downloaded the Python source code and replaced every instance of meta class with class creator. And it's compiled. So I hope this is now making more sense. In fact, I think it's easy to understand it. A class creator is a callable that creates and returns a class. So, for example, this class creator adds the 42 attribute to the class it creates. It starts by calling type. Type is a built-in that creates classes. In fact, it's the default class creator. Now, this, this particular example isn't, isn't useful. And in fact, I think you should avoid using custom class creators without good reason, because they would make your program unusual. But sometimes class creators are useful. For example, in Django, when you create a model such as cat, then cat dot does not exist is also created automatically. It's the custom class creator of model that does this. And it does many other things as well. So you will use class creators when you are developing low level stuff like Django and you want to do some magic. And that's all there is to it, really. This is my last slide. I have nothing more to add. All you need in order to understand meta classes is to mentally replace the term with class creator. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey, I'm back. Uh, thank you very much for the... Um, I was expecting the applause, but we'll, we'll get one for you later. Um, thanks very much for doing this presentation. And we we had some activity in the uh, question and answer room, and uh, it's more like comments. For example, when you showed the two books, uh, uh, we got something from Diego. He said, "I've got both of them," so he was really happy. To... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you made a good choice there. And uh, there was also uh, a comment on black holes. Um, uh, David meant uh, that the intent of calling it a black hole is just to make you think what a hole means. And uh, but he says he's a physicist, so he might be biased to that. <laughs> yeah, I I'm I said I'm not an astronomer. I've I've read a bit. I'm a, a little bit of an amateur astronomer, and uh, well, of course, of course, I'm passionate about being accurate. So black yeah. hole confused me, and I think a beginner might be confused. In some cases. Uh, when you become uh, an expert, so to speak, uh, you are, you come to understand the term, such as uh, in virtual environments. First you are confused, then you come to understand it, but with difficulty. Sometimes I think the, the bad things that the term means stay with you for a long time. And uh, so you, uh, you have probably noticed that I'm very skeptic about artificial intelligence, for example. Yeah, so the, the, you could have used finger quotes or so-called artificial intelligence, which would also mm. have worked fine. Yeah, I always do this so when I write articles. I have, I say probability modeling, and in brackets I say also called artificial intelligence by some people. Yeah. Oh, anyway, we we enjoyed this a lot, so thanks very much, and I think thanks we found lot. your applause, so let's let's play it. <laughs>